The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Shock by Dr. Thomas Shanley You may need to modify equipment or therapies described in this video to meet the needs at your institution. Introduction My name is Tom Shanley. I'm the Director of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital at the University of Michigan. Um, it's my uh, pleasure today to review some of the very basics aspects and physiology of pediatric shock and share with you uh, some of the insights and strategies that we employ uh, in our intensive care unit at the University of Michigan. Key concepts. So first it's important to define uh, what we mean by shock. And shock currently is really a syndrome that results from inadequate oxygen delivery that's sufficient to meet the metabolic demands of the patients. It's important to note right from the beginning that shock necessarily doesn't imply hypotension. And in fact, if we look at some of the literature definitions, there's no requirement for systemic hypotension to make the diagnosis of septic shock in children as there tends to be in adult definitions and studies. Now shock and the inadequate delivery of oxygen can lead to metabolic acidosis, organ dysfunction, and if not reversed, death. So it's important to be able to come up with strategic processes in which we want to treat this entity. So again, in terms of thinking about shock, shock really should be thought of as a failure of oxygen delivery such that the ability of the body to necessarily consume oxygen is insufficient based on what is being delivered. Some typical characteristics of this in the patient setting would be a rising serum lactate, which is reflective of a switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism by the cells. It has a decreased mixed venous saturation, which is reflective of an increased peripheral utilization of oxygen, or in today's common practice, usually measured by central venous catheter saturation in the SVC or sometimes the IVC. And further, as a reflection in an increased uh, arterial to venous oxygen saturation difference, commonly described as the AVDO2. So when we think about the key importance of oxygen delivery, which is noted typically as D.O2, if we think about the physiology of that, the equation that derives D.O2 uh, makes more sense. So oxygen, first of all, must be somehow in the blood, and as it's in the blood, it must be pumped around. So when we think about the formula for that, the content of arterial oxygen reflects that oxygen in the blood, and the cardiac output, of course, reflects that pump pumping it around. So that D.O2 equals the CaO2 times the cardiac output, or CO. So now that we know those parameters, how can a child get into trouble with insufficient oxygen delivery based on the equation? When we think about the content of arterial oxygen, we're all familiar that there should be two forms of oxygen, that bound to hemoglobin and that that's freely dissolved in the, in the bloodstream. The equation for this is 1.36 in most textbooks times the hemoglobin concentration times the saturation and added to that the, deliver, or the dissolved oxygen as reflected by the PaO2 uh, but the coefficient for that variable is quite small, 0 0.003, suggesting that the dissolved oxygen content contributes very little to the overall CaO2 and enables us to primarily focus on the hemoglobin parameter and the oxygen saturation. Defects or deficiencies in both of these parameters uh, can be reflected as um, in two of the shock states. So one called anemic shock state and the other one called hypoxemic shock state. If we just focus very briefly on the saturation component, it's always good to review some of the major contributors of hypoxemia so one of the principal causes associated with lung disease is VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion mismatch. A second major cause is usually characterized as de decreased P big 
AO2 or alveolar O2. If one looks at the alveolar gas equation, equation which is derived to estimate or calculate the PaO2, one notices that because of the barometric pressure contribution, altitude is one reason for that being low. The contribution of the FiO2, so subambient oxygen, uh, usually, usually utilized in the cardiovascular intensive care unit to control pulmonary vascular uh, blood flow would be one other cause of decreased P big AO2. And finally, hypoventilation, usually reflected by an increase in the PaCO2 in the alveolar space, would be another reason, a third cause of decreased PaO2. And finally, of course, cardiac shunts re resulting in cyanotic heart disease uh, would be a third cause. And finally, diffusion block, which fortunately in pediatric critical care is a rare cause, uh, leaving only lung transplants usually for a mechanism to reverse that problem, it causing a lack of diffusion from the oxygen in the alveolar space into the vascular space. So again, as I mentioned earlier, when we run into problems with hemoglobin either being too low or inadequate, an unusual isoform not allowing it to bind sufficiently to oxygen, that would result in what people describe as anemic shock and problems with saturation uh, resulting in hypoxemic shock. Moving forward in terms of the second half of the equation beyond CaO2, when we think about the parameter of cardiac output, we should all be familiar that cardiac output is related or measured by the heart rate times the stroke volume. Now certainly resuscitation research uh, tells us a great deal about problems in heart rate being obviously too low or too fast uh, and should be the target of a second uh, discussion from that aspect. And so I'll focus mostly on the parameter of stroke volume, which we know is classically described as being dependent on preload, contractility, and afterload. And I think in the current era, uh, although preload is uh, one way of thinking about it, another aspect to think about is really combining preload with some other factors and putting it together as diastolic function of the ventricle. When I think about diastolic function, it certainly includes preload, which is usually defined as the ventricular end diastolic volume. And because we're thinking about systemic cardiac output, often the left ventricular end diastolic volume. Of course, that's very difficult to measure. And it is also completely uh, dependent upon ventricular compliance. So how stiff the ventricle may be is also will impede uh, filling of that ventricle and affecting the end diastolic volume. Again, because it's very difficult to measure volume in the ventricular cavity, we usually estimate it as a pressure. In the catheterization lab, we will be able to put a catheter in and directly measure the LVEDP, or the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. But at the, in the intensive care units and at the bedside, that's impractical. In cardiovascular intensive care units, it's not unusual for us to have a catheter in the left atrium so that we can accurately measure the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And certainly in the pediatric intensive care units, we often estimate the LVEDP by the central venous pressure, which has certain caveats because of lung disease and the interference of the lung physiology on that hemodynamic estimate, and certainly always relies on an accurate placement of a central venous catheter into a position that allows us to accurately measure a CVP. So it's important while we use that as an estimate of preload, it certainly uh, has a lot of factors and variables that we need to consider as reflecting the preload itself. Another diastolic function that we tend to think about is described as lusotropic function. And lusotropy really describes the intrinsic relaxation capacity of the myocardium. So again, a stiffer ventricle uh, will not have the ability to relax as efficiently. And there is some data that would suggest in states such as septic shock that this lusotropic property is impaired. So both preload and lusotropy are really crucial to this physiologic principle of diastolic function and preload. And certainly the importance of that is conveyed by the physiology described in the Frank Starling curve, where we know that the ventricular cavity needs to be loaded at a certain uh, volume to have optimal contraction. And that's really what we aim for when we're trying to optimize preload in the setting of cardiovascular dysfunction. So again, by way of review, the stroke volume is dependent on the preload, myocardial contractility, and certainly afterload. That stroke volume combined with the heart rate uh, is important to assess, and both those 
contributing to cardiac output. Therapeutic approaches. Now again, I mentioned at the beginning that hypotension and blood pressure changes should not be relied upon to make the diagnosis of shock. And in children in particular, the capacity of them to be able to augment their vascular resistance, even in the setting of significantly decreased cardiac output, enables them to maintain adequate blood pressure. We often describe this as compensated shock. Uh, and what we want to do is identify the patients that are in this state, provide them adequate resuscitation, and prevent them from proceeding into decompensated shock which is indeed uh, always associated with hypotension. So what signs do we look for in terms of directing our therapeutic approaches? So again, when we think about these parameters that are affecting stroke volume and cardiac output, deficiencies in preload are often characterized by hypovolemic shock. Deficiencies or impairment of contractility reflected by cardiogenic shock. And deficiencies, usually low systemic vascular resistance, tend to be described in uh, what people call distributive shock, implying somewhat a physiology that the effect of circulating volume is somehow maldistributed in the vascular space because of low capacitance uh, of the blood vessels. Point of clarification. Please note that obstruction to blood flow into or out of the heart as a result of a pulmonary embolism or cardiac tamponade may be referred to as obstructive shock. Certainly we do know that afterload can get too high uh, and that, although that's reflected in an afterload concept, what it usually does is impair the ability of the ventricle to contract against that high afterload and ultimately results in impairment and contractility and so usually a cause of cardiogenic shock and certainly decreasing afterload in that context will help. So thinking about these physiologic parameters in the context of the patient bedside requires a thoughtful and logical evaluation to direct our interventions, often based on pattern recognition, focusing on those concepts, the heart rate and rhythm, an estimate of preload, an estimate of contractility, and some estimate of afterload. Such assessments include general observation of the patient itself, himself or herself. Are they alert? Are they interactive? Assessment of the capillary refill is critical. A number of pediatric studies looking at the effective identification of children in compensated shock and effective resuscitation really rely on accurate capillary refill time and a good estimate of pulses, whether they're present, absent, or even if they're present, are they thready or are they normal and strong? Assessment of lung fields is always important uh, because often cardiovascular failure can result in the development of pulmonary edema and want some assessment of that aspect of it. Certainly sepsis and septic shock can be associated with diffuse lung injury and ARDS patterns. So all helpful in terms of providing clues and assessments in terms of the physiology that may be happening at the bedside. Again, cardiogenic shock can result in elevated pulmonary vascular pressures and venous pressures uh, reflecting a uh, backup of blood flow, and that can often be reflected in hepatomegaly as a clue to cardiovascular or cardiogenic shock. There can be differentials uh, with poor perfusion in compensated or certainly in uncompensated shock between what a central core temperature will be measured and what peripheral temperature will be measured, and a differential gradient uh, can indicate significant impairment in terms of cardiovascular function. And obviously an assessment of urine output with the kidneys being one of the easiest uh, observable organs uh, that is directed for end organ perfusion, producing urine output is always valuable to assess. So what do kids typically look like when we describe these classic categories of hypovolemic, distributive, or cardiogenic shock? Well, certainly hypovolemic shock usually has a history characteristic of volume loss, uh, most often in, with gastrointestinal losses from diarrhea or vomiting. Certainly uh, hemorrhage and bleeding can contribute to these types of problems. The patient will have dry mucous membranes, their eyes may be sunken, certainly back in terms of thinking about urine output, they'll be oliguric. And if we happen to have a monitoring device in terms of central venous pressure monitoring, that CVP will often be low. When we think about a child in distributive so shock, we often think of these children being described as being in warm shock. They will ha often have bounding pulses, 
Their capillary refill will be often brisk. In fact, some folks describe it as a flash capillary refill. And if we look at the differential between systolic and diastolic pressures, those will often be wide, indica indicative of a wide pulse pressure. Cardiogenic shock, again, secondary to myocardial dysfunction, is often described as cold because that's what the child will often look like. They'll have diminished peripheral perfusions. They'll look mottled. Their skin may be, in fact, cold. And co in contrast to distributive shock, they will often have a narrow pulse pressure. Again, assessing capillary refill uh, is, can be a very simple bedside procedure uh, that done adequately, as de demonstrated in the pictures, can show that normal capillary refill should be within two seconds, and any delay in this uh, can be a significant indication of inadequate cardiac output. When we think about the support of uh, the basic supports for sh these shock states, Hypovolemia obviously should be directed at fluid resuscitation. Cardiogenic shock, uh, certainly a pri the primary modality should be the addition of inotropic agents. And as we mentioned, the importance of lucitropy uh, agents that have lucitropic properties, which would include milrinone, uh, can also be thought of in that setting. And certainly in distributive shock with low SVR states, using vasopressors would be the mainstay therapy of that. Now there are certain guidelines regarding resuscitation recommendations that historically uh, started out of the uh, American Heart Association and have been documented uh, and updated uh, usually frequently uh, in the PALS provider manual, which promotes importantly early recognition uh, and advances of trying to identify compensated shock before patients uh, and children decompensate into uncompensated shock and hypotension is manifest. There's some notable studies suggesting that the, the importance of the role of fluid resuscitation. One such study uh, done by Carso Carcillo et al. in 1991 actually challenged a, a theory that per perhaps fluid resuscitation in the setting of sepsis, for example, would not be so much of benefit because it might contribute to further lung injury or perhaps cerebral edema. And in this study in which patients were randomized to fluid resuscitation based on amounts, you can see that the patient, the patient group that received greater than 40 cc's per kilo had in fact a significant improvement in their survivorship from sepsis. This was an early indication that fluid resuscitation was key moving the time frame in terms of intervening with fluid resuscitation into an emphasizing an earlier phase was suggested by Han et al. and his colleagues, which early reversal of pediatric and neonatal shock actually in the community setting by physicians was associated with improved outcome. It's critical, although this is outside of the intensive care units, we are commonly receiving patients from the outside setting. And so it's important for physicians in that setting when we're advising our colleagues taking care of patients in the outside setting to really emphasize the need for assessing this aspect of cardiogenic and uh, hypovolemic shocks and encouraging them to think consistently about accurate fluid resuscitation. From Han et al. study, you can see that patient survival when shock was reversed adequately in the community setting was significantly improved compared to those that didn't have their shock reversed in that setting. Furthermore, when the resuscitation was done based on a best practice articulated by the PALS guidelines, again, this practice or best practice conferred a patient, an improvement in patient survival such that there were significant odds ratios that showed a benefit to early and effective resuscitation being key in this patient population. Formal evaluation of moving the time frame of fluid resuscitation and adequate resuscitation into an earlier time frame was importantly substantiated by the Rivers et al. study, which every critical care physician should be well aware of. This looked at early goal-directed therapy in an in adult cohort with severe sepsis and septic shock. And while a very complex algorithm was noted, that if patients could be targeted for adequate resuscitation, in this case measured by improving the mixed venous saturation, there was a significant improvement in outcome. It's this type of work and these types of studies that really enabled our groups 
uh, together to develop improved parameters. And so most recently, the clinical practice parameters for hemodynamic support of pediatric and neonatal patients in shock, and notably septic shock, has designed an algorithm to help us go through the process of early resuscitation and identifying physiologic parameters that can then direct our therapeutic interventions. What's notable in this algorithm is the early, within 15 minutes, uh, application of aggressive fluid resuscitation, usually up to 60 cc's per kilo to, with continual assessment of the patient's hemodynamic and physiology, to assess the benefit of that fluid resuscitation. When patients might not respond to that with adequate titration, we describe that as fluid refractory shock and then begin further algorithms in terms of directing care. Again, to the more recent study by Han et al, looking at early shock reversal, it being able to reduce child mortality and neurologic morbidity in all shock states, uh, shows the importance of this early intervention. In this particular study, hypotension was actually defined by systolic blood pressure less than the fifth percentile for age, according to PALS criteria. They utilized, because it was an outpatient setting and really wanting to emphasize the bedside practice and the ease of practice of determining hemodynamic states, looked at prolonged capillary refill as an important parameter to determine. Prolonged cap refill was defined as greater than three seconds. And so that in this particular study, shock, for the purpose of the study, was defined as the presence of either prolonged capillary refill and or hypotension. It's important to note that in this study, while only about 350 or so patients, about 10% of the cohort were actually specifically referred for shock, when the medical team for transport arrived out there, nearly 40% of patients fulfilled their definition of shock criteria either by prolonged capillary refill and or hypotension. So it really emphasizes the need for us to articulate the assessment needs of shock and compensated shock in the community setting and in fact in our own hospital settings. So recognition is key to this aspect. Reversal of this, so addressing uh, hypotension or abnormal capillary refill, again emphasized in the study as being critical because those patients that were accepted with the combination of that fulfilling shock criteria had a significant increase in their mortality rate, nearly three times the typical uh, rate for septic shock. And achieving resolution was not only um, important in terms of avoiding neuromorbidity, but it did indeed have a fact in, in an impact in mortality overall. So it's these types of studies, again, focusing on re early recognition of signs of shock being present because they do occur in a significant number of our children, that the presence of these physical signs are uh, indicative of an increased mortality rate and even a neuromorbidity rate, and that early reversal of these signs is associated with significantly improved outcome. Again, we have standard operating procedures, if you will, or best practices for early goal-directed fluid resuscitation uh, defined in large part by PALS and our algorithms. And if community physicians and ourselves can practice this, they do confer significant improvements in benef uh, of benefit to patient outcomes. When one moves down the algorithm beyond fluid refractory uh, shock, Usually the early initiation of an inotropic agent is the next stage. Beyond that, there's a call for determining whether a patient falls into either cold or warm shock. And if you recall earlier in my discussion, we talked about cardiogenic shock often being associated with modeled appearance, decreased pulses, prolonged capillary refill, being indicative of cold shock whereas the distributive shock patients looking more warm with bounding pulses often flash capillary refill and that wide uh, pulse pressure. Being able to delineate between those two states of either cold and usually cardiogenic shock or warm and usually typically distributive shock will then direct your therapeutic intervention next. So again, in the setting of cold shock, the algorithm would tell you to initiate inotropic therapies in the setting of adequate blood pressure, even decreasing the systemic vascular resistance may be of benefit. Again, whereas in warm shock, adding a vasopressor as the next typical therapeutic intervention would make more sense in an attempt to increase the systemic vascular resistance.
So another key discriminating factor that's different between adults and children related to septic shock, uh, notably, is that in adults, that is typically characterized by a heart, high cardiac output state or a supernormal cardiac output and a very low systemic vascular resistance state. So in usually typically 85% or so of adult septic shock patients, that's the typical physiologic parameters that one sees. In stark contrast, the hemodynamic profile that's typically seen in pediatric septic shock, as in part delineated by Cineviva and colleagues all the way back in 1998, which suggests that there's three typical hemodynamic parameters. The most common in almost up to 60% 60, 60 of patients is that the cardiac index is in fact reduced and the systemic vascular resistance in stark contrast to adults is often high. About 20% of patients will have reduced cardiac output with a normal systemic vascular resistance. So in up to 80% of pediatric patients, there is usually a decreased cardiac output and at most a normal but often an elevated systemic vascular resistance. We still do have in about 20 to 25% of patients that typical adult parameter or that adult profile of a high cardiac index and a low systemic vascular resistance. And particularly in pediatric profiles with a low cardiac output and a high SVR state, there is a significant increase in the 28 day mortality noted up to 28 to 30 percent, again three times our typical mortality rate for all patients, all pediatric patients with sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock. So again, if we look at a general summary in the setting of cardiogenic shock, first line therapy would be inotropic agents such as dopamine or dobutamine, or also could include low dose epinephrine at a, again at a dose that typically does not affect the systemic vascular resistance or alpha um, stimulation. Again, in the setting of normal uh, blood pressure, the addition of an agent that can afterload reduce that patient and lower the systemic vascular resistance, such as milrinone, that also carries inotropic properties, would be something to consider as well. And so milrinone, often described as one of the key ino dilators, uh, would be something to consider. In contrast, when we think about uh, patients with distributive shock and a low systemic vascular resistance, vasopressor options would include things like high-dose dopamine and high-dose epinephrine where the alpha receptors of the peripheral vasculature can be activated to cause vasoconstriction. Norepinephrine also could do the same thing and brings the added benefit of beta stimulation to help the cardiac output in the setting of increasing the systemic vascular resistance. There can be some pure alpha agents that can be utilized like neosinephrine. And finally, because of the concern that sometimes the adrenergic receptor signaling pathways uh, might not be effectively activated, vasopressin, which has specific receptors on the peripheral vasculature, could be considered to increase the systemic vascular resistance. So in summary, it's key to know how the basic principles of oxygen delivery are dependent on the content of arterial oxygen and cardiovascular function. It's key in this patient population to recognize the need for adequate resuscitation and reversal of these shock states, and to do that in compliance with the guidelines that dictate our best practices based on what we know improves very important outcomes, notably mortality. The clinician should continue to maintain good monitoring as the physiology can, can change in your patients and really to titrate your therapeutic target goals to the physiology that you're continuing to observe. Critically ill and injured children in our pediatric intensive care units display these unique physiologies. And that setting really provides a unique opportunity for observing these practices and these concepts in practice. Case study. So if we uh, look at and try to apply some of these principles in the case scenario setting, We'll look at a one-year-old patient who's known to have dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart rate is 180 beats per minute. It is sinus tachycardia. A measured central venous pressure in the superior vena cava is 20 millimeters of mercury. The blood pressure is 60 over 30. There's some evidence by serial blood gas determination that the lactate is increasing. And a mixed venous saturation uh, from the superior vena cava is 55%. A capillary refill check notes five seconds to refill. 
So what would you consider in this setting the best treatment option, either an inotropic agent with epinephrine, an inodilator bolus with milrinone, addition of a vasopressor, a fluid bolus, or a beta blocker such as esmolol to slow the heart rate? Please click the Start a New Discussion button to leave your answer. When we think through this process, highlighting some of the aspects of this particular case scenario, we note that there's a very high heart rate, usually indicative of compensated shock. In this case, there's a high central venous pressure. It would usually indicate that the vascular volume probably is adequate, although of course we have to be careful that this high CVP may reflect significant cardiogenic failure. The blood pressure is certainly low, and it does appear that by clinical examination, the patient is in a cold shock, so probably safe to assume that the systemic vascular resistance is high and the afterload is high. There's evidence of evolving shock, although compensated somewhat to this point, with lactic acidosis in a low SVO2 state. So given this total clinical scenario, probably the most appropriate answer to next would be the addition of a pure inotropic agent, such as low-dose epinephrine. If we look through the rest of the answers, considering a bolus of an inodilator, given the concern of the hypotension that's already present, would probably not be an adequate uh, or an appropriate maneuver at this point in time. Even with the low blood pressure initially, the initiation of an infusion of milrinone might be a little bit risky until we have a higher blood pressure more in the normal range, but certainly would be something to be thinking about adding later in the course of this particular case presentation. Again, since we've made an assessment that the SVRI is high, using a strong vasopressor such as phenylephrine or vasopressin would not make much sense physiologically. One could consider a fluid bolus. However, given the central venous pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury already, even if the tank is not yet full and this is reflective more of cardiogenic failure, certainly the addition of an inotrope would be the higher priority at this point in time and seeing what that might do to the central venous pressure over time. Finally, using a beta blocker to slow the heart rate would certainly be taking, first of all, away a compensatory mechanism that the patient is using uh, as an as a ability to augment their oxygen delivery, and adding further uh, impairment of cardiovascular function with a beta blocker would not be something that we'd want to use. If we change the, car the case scenario slightly, so the same one-year-old patient who's tachycardic, but in this case, the central venous pressure is measured as only five, with the rest of the parameters being unchanged. If we think through what we'd want to do next, clearly this would change our options, and probably our initial therapy here would be a fluid bolus to see how much fluid responsiveness in this clinical scenario we might have before jumping straight ahead to an inotropic agent. Again, if we modify things a little bit, as I mentioned earlier, the blood pressure in the initial case scenario was quite low. If instead the same patient who's in compensated shock and doing a very good job of maintaining their blood pressure at 110 over 90 presented, in this case now, adding both an inotropic agent as well as a vasodilating agent and therefore using an agent such as milrinone which can combine both those parameters would be an obvious first choice. Finally, if we switch to a patient who's one year old with hyperdynamic septic shock, still tachycardic to 180, a central venous pressure of 20, hypotensive at 60 over 30, and again with indication of progressive shock, even with a capillary refill of one second, that sounds to us like the types of patients we were describing with warm shock, and therefore needing an augmentation of the systemic vascular resistance, in which case the addition of a vasopressor such as norepin, norepinephrine, or perhaps vasopressin would make the most sense in terms of the next treatment algorithm. So I hope by going through these case scenarios, we can see how applying what we're assessing in terms of the physiologic parameters will direct what our therapeutic interventions are, uh, all to try to improve the outcomes of our patients that are within shock. That concludes our video on shock. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at
openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the guided learning pathway.